We talk a lot about human rights, but we're not always aware of education as being one of them. Next on Global Perspectives, we'll talk to a man who is living proof of the opportunities that education can bring. This program is made possible, in part, by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Center at UCF. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to Global Perspectives. Consider for a moment the needs of children around the world. We are all too aware of the impact of hunger on young bodies. And we are becoming more aware of the hunger in those same children for education. In some cases, that hunger can be dangerous, as in the case of a Pakistani girl shot by extremists because she spoke out in favor of education for women. Our guest today is well aware of these dangers and the need. Kenyan activist Chris Mburu works with the UN Human Rights Agency in Geneva, Switzerland. He is also the subject of an award-winning documentary, A Small Act. Welcome to the show, Mr. Mburu. Thank you very much. Tell us about your human rights activities, um, and, and we want to get into the documentary too, but um, when did you first get inspired about human rights? Was it as a, a young man? Was it later in life? Um, tell, tell us a little bit about that story. Well, I grew up in, um, uh, in a country that was not known for respecting human rights. Um, in Kenya, at the time I was growing up, uh, there was quite um, a lot of repression. And um, I was very aware to um, the fact that um, there was this inequality and this uh, repression going on in the country. And um, as a young uh, university student, I became very interested in human rights issues, especially after one of my cousins um, got imprisoned because of expressing his political views. And um, I remember when he was being led to the cells after being sentenced uh, with a crime that they call sedition. Um, and um, he basically encouraged the rest of us and said, the struggle has to continue. So I became very interested and he really did inspire me into um, considering a career in human rights. What happened to him? Well, he was um, imprisoned for three years and um, you know, he's, uh, he came out eventually, but that was an imprisonment that was unjust and I felt it. And I was a young man, but I felt very, very strongly that people needed to do something to fight against that kind of persecution. Later on, I decided to pursue a career in law. And uh, obviously, when you're studying law, you're studying, you know, injustice and, you know, inequalities and all sorts of things. And um, I progressively, again, uh, in sync with what was going on in my country, I strongly felt that I should take up a career in human rights. And that's when I decided to make human rights the focus of my academic work. Now you've done work in the human rights area in Kenya, but you've also done work um, internationally via the United Nations. What is rewarding about each of those? Well, the thing that is rewarding about human rights in general is that you are basically working for people whose rights have been violated. So you're, 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 you're constantly dealing with people whose rights have been taken away. And I think the point of gratification um, in this work is when you are ensuring the restoration of these people's rights, when you are doing something to make sure that these people enjoy their fundamental human rights, um, when nothing gives me greater pleasure than to see that political prisoner come out because of some, um, some activity that has been undertaken in terms of advocacy towards getting that prisoner out. Um, I used to work, before my UN career, I used to work with um, Amnesty International, which is uh, an organization that is very well known for defending people's rights. 
And um, I remember I used to deal with uh, specific cases of human rights violations, you know, like individuals who had been imprisoned, individuals who had been tortured um, or suffered indignities as a result of their outspokenness for human rights causes. But one of the cases I was assigned was um, a prominent politician from um, Malawi. Um, he used to be a trade unionist and uh, he had really suffered as a result of his outspokenness against the government. And he had been imprisoned, exiled, tortured, you know, all sorts of human rights violations had been visited upon him. And uh, when I was working for Amnesty International, part of my work was to um, encourage uh, Amnesty International members to write letters uh, to the Malawian government to have this man released. And after a long campaign, uh, this man was eventually released and actually went on to run for the presidency of his own country. He did not win, but you know, he, 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 he became free and was able to exercise all his you know, fundamental rights, including his constitutional rights to run for office. And it's uh, moments like those that show us that what we are doing is right. Now, did you and, and do you frequently have a chance to meet the people you help, or is a lot of the work at a distance? We get uh, to meet the people we help. And, um, you know, you, you, you see prisoners who have come out of prison. You see um, uh, torture victims who have left the torture chambers. Uh, so you get to see uh, the fruits of your work. Working with the United Nations is um, also quite gratifying because what we are doing um, in terms of my own work within the United Nations is helping governments um, respect and protect these human rights. And one of the ways in which we do that is actually training government personnel on their government's obligations under international human rights law. Is, is it your sense that overall the situation is better? We, we see the, the trend in so many parts of the world toward democratic or dem democratically oriented governments, and, and it seems that more respect is building for human rights. Is, is that your sense, or do we still have a long way to go in many parts of the world? We, we do have uh, quite some way to go, but um, the human rights movement has made giant leaps forward um, in the last 64 years since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1948. Really, um, that was a turning point in the current, in, in, in the comprehension of the current system of human rights. And um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights sort of set the tone for what was required for the world to move forward in terms of protecting and promoting these rights. And as you well know, um, following the declaration, um, there have been uh, quite many uh, international conventions whose purpose has been to tighten the screws on uh, respect for human rights and basically creating legal obligations on states to respect and promote these rights. That's why we have you know, the Convention Against Torture, for example, uh, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, uh, the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. All these conventions, and recently we've had a new convention on um, uh, preventing the discrimination on um, um, disabled people, you know, disabilities. So the movement has really grown. And um, now we have a human rights protection system um, that has become universal, uh, that has become acceptable by all the member states of the United Nations. We still have, obviously, um, violations going on uh, because you'll always have you know, errant soldiers, errant um, police officers, and um, you know, government policies that do not quite respect human rights. But all in all, uh, we can say that the, 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 the understanding of the 
universal application of the concept of human rights has deeply grown over the last 64 years, and that is something to be happy about. However, we do have a long way to go. We still have uh, regimes that do not respect human rights. We still have uh, people being tortured. We still have people being shot around in the streets because of expressing uh, an opinion different from their governments. That is very unpo unfortunate, but we do strongly feel that the movement is irreversible. Mm -hmm. It's been moving to the right direction. Where does the responsibility lie for advancing human rights? Is this something that people collectively have the obligation to try to encourage from the grassroots? Is it principally the work of governments and international organizations? Um, and, and where has the progress really come from in, in terms of encouraging it in the right direction? Well, the key um, responsibility for protecting and promoting human rights lies with the governments. Um, because um, the governments basically are elected through the will of the people. So they, their actions must reflect the, the, the need and the desire by the populations that they lead uh, towards making you know, their countries civilized places where people can enjoy life, respect, and dignity. Um, so we have sort of um, accorded that responsibility to governments. We also have uh, a big responsibility as citizens to ensure that we create the safeguards that are necessary to ensure that the government carries out these responsibilities. And that is why we encourage um, citizens groups that are speaking out uh, on human rights violations. We encourage what we call the civil society, um, non-government organizations that uh, speak about human rights violations, help governments understand where human rights are being violated. Um, so. The, the governments are what we call uh, the duty bearers. They, they, they bear the duty to provide the protection and promotion of human rights. We have the population that we technically call uh, rights holders. Mm -hmm. They hold the rights. And the role of the government is to make sure that those rights that are inherently held by the population are protected. So the, the responsibility lies with the government, uh, but uh, should we you know, turn our backs on the government and say, this is your job, we have nothing to do with it? No. We need uh, to be in it as citizens to, one, support the government in ensuring the protection of these rights, um, but secondly, to point out um, when these rights are not being respected. What happens when you have a government that pays lip service to human rights, that has a constitution guaranteeing the whole array of, of, of rights and, and yet doesn't follow through? Um, is, is it principally the responsibility of people within that country to deal with the issue, or is it something that the international community should concern itself with? I think that is uh, uh, an issue that uh, should concern both the people at the national level and the international community. In fact, that is where organizations like the United Nations come in. It's become very clear that um, what happens in a country is not the, 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 the preserve of that particular country. Um, what happens in country A affects country B, affects the international community in general. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So it's very, very important that if there's injustice in any one country, that the international community through organizations like the United Nations, regional organizations like the economic community of um, American states, you know, that they can stand up and say to the government, no, you're not allowed to do this because this runs counter to the commitments that you have made or the commitments that we have made collectively 
um, as, as, as members of the United Nations um, to protect human rights. Tell us about the, the role of education in human rights. Um, how important is it and what is your part in that? I did talk about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is um, what basically spells out what rights people all over the world are entitled to. Now, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as uh, the, the subsequent conventions uh, do, um, outlines what we call economic, social, and cultural rights. There are two sets of rights. There are political and civil rights. That's where you, we talk about torture, we talk about freedom of expression, we talk about uh, the right to assembly and all the other um, constitutional rights. But we have another set of rights which are equally important, if not more important, economic, social, and cultural rights. These are what sometimes are called welfare rights. Um, and education is one of these rights. If you look at Article 26 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it states very clearly that everyone has a right to education. So education is not a concept that we talk about in the abstract. It is a concept that has been incorporated in international human rights law. So uh, governments have a responsibility to ensure that everybody gets an education. Now, when you talk about the right to education in a place like the United States, it sounds very ordinary. It sounds very, very normal, you know, like, People have really have exercised the right to education. People, you know, kids go to school. Um, there are libraries, there are facilities, there's everything that you need to go to school. Kids don't drop out of school unless they want. They don't drop out of school because they've been pushed by poverty. And that's the difference between the United States and many other countries uh, of the world and uh, in particular countries in Africa, where education continues to be a huge challenge. And the, 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 the restoration of this right to millions of people in Africa remains a dream. And that's why um, I started a foundation to talk about the need for human rights. I was um, growing up in Kenya in a small village um, many years ago. Um, and I could, did not have, my family did not have enough money to take me through to school because education was not free. And I only got an education because I got the support of a woman who lived in far away Sweden. And so um, I felt very, very strongly that um, education should be considered a human right and that we don't need to have um, you know charitable individuals providing for the education of uh, kids anywhere in the world this is a responsibility that has been recognized by international human rights law and it is a responsibility that should be carried by all governments and all children everywhere in the world should enjoy this right to education do you feel that the opportunity is especially good now for this right to expand, especially in light of technological advances that make it possible to deliver education to places that were unreachable before? Technology has um, helped a big deal. But unfortunately, um, the nature of the poverty in many of the countries that I have been and that I talk about um, is such that technology does not actually penetrate to these communities. I come from a village where, you know, we have schools where there's no running water. There's no, kids have never heard of a library. They don't understand the concept of a library. They do not have laboratories. They do not have um, adequate uh, teachers. You know, some of these schools have a population of, you know, 600 children with six teachers. 
and it's 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 so when you talk about the right to education in such a context you're talking about something that has yet to be achieved and that really needs to be worked for in many of these um, communities and, and other countries um, kids don't even get um, a right the, 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 the right to go to school kids from poor families do not access the school system because they just can't pay um, in some countries uh, kids can access education at the primary level but when they get to the secondary school level they, there's nobody to pick up the tab for them and they drop out of school and they get married they s have to look for jobs and they you know they do everything that kids are not supposed to be doing at their age so it is um, a fundamental human right but it is a right that is violated every day in many many countries and it's also um, a lot of people say well some of these countries are too poor to afford uh, to take the kids through the education system and I do disagree with that I think it's an it's a matter of prioritization um, sometimes in the same countries where you have uh, huge um, problems uh, challenges uh, of accessing education you also have you know government expenditure that is really you know unjustified and uh, you know that all you need to do in those situations is reallocate the resources to um, the education sector and then you have a lot of these kids educated so I, I feel very very strongly that we're not doing enough in many many countries to uh, recognize education as the bedrock of development and to address the need for kids to access education and access quality education. Tell us how your documentary fits into the education discussion. I was um, growing up in, uh, in, in this village in, uh, in rural Kenya and um, because my family was not able to support my education you know I was supported by this woman from Sweden and um, as a result of that I felt very strongly that I should do something to help kids who are in the situation I once was you know because as a result of this uh, woman's actions I was able to get an education I was able to study law in uh, Kenya and I was eventually able to study law in uh, the United States at Harvard law school so I felt very privileged but I also felt somewhat guilty because I had gotten this far just because of the help that I received from this woman but there were so many people back home where I was growing up who did not get that opportunity and so I decided to do something about this by creating a foundation in my village that I named after the woman who supported me after the Swedish woman who supported me her name was Hilda Back so I named my foundation the Hilda Back Education Fund and that's what sparked the film because some woman from Hollywood uh, who, who directs uh, movies heard about the story and she got very interested in um, doing a film about it and she did a film um, that did very well and the film is called A Small Act. Great. Well, thank you for sharing and thank you for joining us today, Mr. Mburu. Thank you very much. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia and we'll see you next time. This program is made possible in part by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Center at UCF.